the October um, Educator Network meeting. Um, we've obviously had a little bit of a break over the summer and hopefully you all got a little bit of a break uh, from work and, and all the stresses that come with it. Um, and now we're back and uh, hopefully refreshed um, and kind of ready to pick up where we, where we left off. Um, I'd like to just start off by thanking Lee uh, from the BPS for all his work behind the scenes, getting it all together, publicising it, um, promoting it, setting up the registration, etc. Obviously, that's invaluable for us uh, to be able to put these uh, meetings together. Um, and also a, a big thanks to those that have uh, volunteered or been volunteered um, to help out with the, the breakout rooms later on. So that's Aidan, Anya, Christine and, and Susan. Um, much appreciated for that. Um, so just to familiarise everyone with the, the format for this afternoon, um, the first half um, is going to be uh, a talk that's going to be given um, by Kim Wharton, uh, who is joining us uh, from Pharmalex, and he's going to talk about regulatory processes. Um, for about 20 minutes or so, there'll then be some time for questions uh, for Kim uh, once uh, he completes his talk. Um, in the second half um, of the hour, we'll then move into breakout rooms and continue our curriculum review, moving on to talk about the core skills associated with the undergraduate core curriculum, because we've now kind of reached a point of completing the knowledge mm -hmm. statement. So without further ado, we've got lots to get through, so we'll, we'll just crack on. Um, I'll hand over uh, to Kim uh, Wharton, who, as I say, is going to tell us about regulatory processes. Take it away, Kim. Okay, thank, thanks, Steve, and uh, it's uh, nice, nice to speak with everyone. I'll just try and share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Let's just put it on to all sides. Is that looking good for everybody? Yep, okay, perfect. All right, great. So um, just by way of a very quick introduction to myself first, um, I've been in regulatory affairs about um, 30 years. Um, spent 10 of those in Glaxo and Glaxo Welcome, uh, and then left when it was just about to become GSK and set up my own business, Regulus, um, in which we provided regulatory drug safety and quality compliance services to biotech, pharma and medical device companies. And then last year, uh, my wife and I sold Regulus to Pharmalex, which is why I might have been branded as being Regulus Managing Director when the promotion first started for today. Um, but I've now been introduced as being part of Pharmalex, which is absolutely correct. Um, before I got into regulatory affairs, I worked in R&D in genetic toxicology and pharmacology. And it was one of my old pharmacology colleagues at Glaxo who asked me if I would help, help out with this. So it's a, it's a pleasure to kind of be able to speak sort of through something organized by the um, BPS because you know once upon a time when I was in R&D I guess I was classified as a pharmacologist so it's nice to be able to speak to people today. Uh, so if I go on and just uh, run through the topics I'm going to cover I'm going to try and have a or run through a look at the data requirements for a marketing authorization application and I should just say I've tried to put um, abbreviations after um, all the different things because regulatory affairs is one of those horrible areas where there seems to be an absolute overload of initials and acronyms and abbreviations. But I've also put an abbreviations um, slide at the back so that you have that to refer to in the future or, or to look back at. Um, so we'll talk briefly about data requirements and the sort of structure of a marketing authorization application. We'll then go on to have a look at the procedures themselves the different application types and the basis for, for submissions to be made to the authorities. A look at the different registration routes and touch on what's done both in the EU and now in the UK post um, Brexit. So from the start of this year, I'm going to briefly um, touch on license maintenance procedures, although I, I say briefly because I think I have quite a lot of slides to get through in the time I've got anyway. So I left it in there, but not with too much detail. And then I've also put together some useful links that I hope will be helpful to either you guys or uh, students as well. Um, and, and then obviously, they, hopefully, if all goes to plan, there'll be about 10 minutes or so for questions. And if we run short of time there, I think Lee's or, Lee and I have already agreed that you'll collate them, Lee, and send them over to me. And I'll do my best to answer them afterwards as well. So 
um, getting stuck into um, uh, some of the, uh, the topics here. So the first sort of point that I want to run through is what's required in a Marketing Authorization Act. Uh, application and perhaps the the easiest way to to describe this is to do it in modules because modules are the way in which the data are ultimately presented when an application is submitted to an authority so there are five modules as you can see on this slide module one is is an administrative section although um, that doesn't really do all the documents in their justice because there are things like an application form and various annexes to that. But there's also the summary of product characteristics proposed for the product. So that's, that's the, um, the, the document that you might um, see. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with the EMC, the Medicines Compendium in this country. But that's where um, the sheets that a, date, a doctor would refer to to prescribe a product. So to see what it's indicated for, what it's not indicated for, um, you know, side effect profile, that kind of thing. That's where they would look. So that document's a pretty important clinically orientated document. There's also the packaging in there, the leaflet and the labeling. Um, some expert signature pages, which I will just put into context when I move a bit further down this screen. Uh, there are other documents, there are a number of them, this, this list in this slide is not absolutely exhaustive, but I just picked out some of the key ones. So all, all new medicines have to have an environmental risk assessment these days to show that there's going to be no adverse impact in the environment, so getting into the water table, um, disposal, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's a, a description of the applicant's pharmacovigilance holder and quite a complex clinical safety document um, called a risk management plan or RMP that um, has to sort of address all the risks associated with the product and in some cases propose mitigation or minimization measures for those risks. And section two or module two has um, high level summaries in it. So we have, we have three summaries or three sections really, if you like, we have a quality overall summary. That's a summary of the information in module three. So if you just flick your eyes down to module three, that although it's got a rather grand title, um, chemical, pharmacological and biological documentation is basically how the product's made and the quality is controlled. Um, so that, that QOS is, is a summary of the manufacturing kind of information. Then there is a non-clinical section and a clinical section. Uh, and just to be different, the non-clinical section has a summary and an overview in it, as does the clinical section. And that's because the summaries are factual and the overviews are more of a critique of the data that you're presenting to the authority. Um, and just an interesting sort of point to note here, when agencies assess these, there's quite a stark contrast between the EU and UK. Um, and the USA and, and FDA's approach. So the European agencies will take a look at the summaries uh, and then drill down into any issues they find in those overviews and summaries and look at the data in the later modules. Whereas the FDA seem to have a less trusting approach, should we say, to what companies put into a dossier. So they tend to go for the raw data first down in modules four and five study reports and things like that and then go and perhaps have a look at what you've said about issues that they find. So it's very much um, bottom up as far as the US is concerned and maybe a bit more top down in Europe and UK. So I just mentioned toxicological information and clinical information. So module four contains all the toxicological and pharmacological test data. So for a new active substance, that would be um, uh, toxicological tests and pharmacological tests that have been conducted um, and study reports uh, and, and data from those. So, you know, you can imagine in the good old days of doing paper submissions, there could be some pretty chunky um, sections to those, those modules. Um, and, and module five is the clinical trial data. So that will be clinical pharmacology um, and phase, um, you know, so phase one, right the way through to phase three data, safety and efficacy trials. Um, and um, just one other, a couple of other points to make here. If, if you have a drug which is perhaps a little bit more well-known, maybe it's not a completely new active ingredient, 
then these module fours and fives can be um, can contain published data and literature rather than study reports that are um, you know uh, newly originally constructed by the applicant. So just a, a quick point on practical stuff here. The red is because I put a hyperlink in my links slide. So it's just so that you can kind of relate to that when, when, when you look at it later. Okay, so if I move on to the next slide, another way of just looking at the content of a dossier, uh, and by the way, we call it a CTD, uh, you may have heard of that term, Common Technical docu Document, I think that should be actually rather than dossier, so apologies for that. Um, that, that, um, that pyramid is quite a kind of well-known pyramid in regulatory circles, so you have the kind of, if you like, the raw data in modules three, four, and five, the summaries above that, the, the critique, the overviews for the non-clinical and clinical sections above that, and then essentially content information and module one information at the top. Um, and, and there's a, a very useful regulatory Bible that you may, some of you may have heard of called the Notice to Applicants in Europe. Um, and that has a, a lot about the more detail about structure and the content. Um, and um, I've just put a link to that as well. Actually, one thing I did uh, just want to mention going back to this is these guidelines that I highlighted on here, they have a little bit more detail than I've got time to go into on what's expected in those sections on, on modules three, four, and five. Okay, so if we just jump down and move on to the next section. So this is to talk a little bit about the drug registration procedures. And to get our heads around this, we need to start off by thinking about the types of products that exist and, and what legal basis you can make an application for a marketing authorization under. So there's, rather, there's a few directive um, clauses laid out in here, but it's kind of good, good sort of, um, uh, you, you know, kind of reference information, if you like. So there's a, there's a couple of directives as, as outlined at the top for um, you know, where that legal basis is written down in, in, in law, if you like. Um, and then if we look at the different application types, we have an, you know, a new medicinal product. And by that, I mean something that has a new, as yet unlicensed active ingredient or active substance. And we always refer to that as an Article 8.3 application because it's that section of, of, of the uh, directive that um, specifies or lays down the kind of uh, permissives, if you like, the permissions for that type of application and the rules. Uh, and then uh, there are other types of products, and I'm sure you've all heard of generic medicines, you know what they are. Um, those, you know, those fall under a different article, Article 10. Um, generics themselves are Article 10.1. But what I've done here is clumped in some other types of products. So what we would call a hybrid. So this is where you would have a product that perhaps Maybe it's a new pharmaceutical form of a known active ingredient or something like that. So you end up with some new data that you've generated as a company, but you rely on some reference published data as well. Um, and you, uh, you know, so it's, it's not a true generic, but nor is it a new active substance. So that is also an Article 10 application. Um, and then, because I've got all your pictures up, hang on, I'm just going to really, I can't quite see the end of my slides. Oh, yeah, and, and biolog similar biological products also come, can come under that article. Um, there's then um, uh, something called the well-established use um, procedure or WEU. And this is where um, maybe, um, you, well, you've got a product which has been used for a, lot, a good number of years in the European Union. Uh, and therefore you make reference to that and provide data. And it allows you to reduce your data a bit, um, support it just by bibliographic um, data, but rely a bit on the fact that there is a well-established medicinal use for the product. Of course, the important point that is perhaps obvious, but perhaps not, is it has to be a well-established medicinal use in the same use that you're applying for in your marketing authorization application. So you can't deviate from that well-established medicinal uh, use. So that's, that's under Article 10A. And then there's Article 10B, which covers fixed combination products. So this is where you've got more than one active substance or active ingredient in a medicinal product. I'm trying to think of a quick, good example of that. Something like um, a, um, 
an H2 antagonist or a um, lacomeprazole, a PPI, proton pump inhibitor, that might have an antibiotic um, in it to kill off uh, Helicobacter pylori in your stomach, something like that. So treatment of acid uh, and, and taking out a bacteria that might be making a condition worse. Um, and then the last one under Article 10C of uh, Directive um, 2001-83, is something called an informed consent application. So this is where the, a license exists and effectively you want a duplicate license for that product. So more often than not, it's used by the same company to get a second license or probably for some kind of commercial reason. Um, but um, it can be used between companies if one company is willing to provide the informed consent. And it's like a kind of reference to the existing license to allow a duplicate to be authorized. So you can see when you look down this list that there's, there's quite a difference in the amount of information and data that would go into a submission. And therefore, in some cases, the timelines to assess these as well. So obviously the most complex are the new products that are a new active substance. And the simplest one is the kind of duplicate at the bottom. Okay, if I jump onto the next uh, slide now. So on this slide, I just want to talk about the registration routes or procedures that themselves that are available. So I've done this on an EU basis. So this is the picture in the European Union. We'll then talk a bit about the UK situation because obviously things, things changed as a result of Brexit. Um, so there are, Four procedures available to a company who want to license a product in the in the EU, uh, and, I, and I've got some more details on these procedures in the subsequent slides. So um, these are just some highlights here. So the centralised procedure is where you submit one application, one marketing authorization application. You get one assessment coordinated by uh, the EMA, um, and you get a single EU license. So that allows you to market your drug subject to getting things like pricing approval, which is outside of the scope of today's talk. Um, but you get one license, you can market your drug in all 28 European countries. Um, the decentralized procedure is one where you submit multiple applications, the same application um, to um, a number of national agencies that you choose. Um, so you could choose to submit in, say, but companies will often choose to submit in, say, the big five because they're commercially maybe more viable. Um, or they may choose to submit where there's a greater medical need in some particular countries as well, and therefore not to submit across the whole of the EU in, in one go. Um, and with that process, you get national licenses or national marketing authorizations granted on the basis of mutual recognition. So you get one agency, like a lead agency, who does the assessment, and the other countries you've involved in the process, hopefully approve um, the drug in their country based on mutual recognition. There's anything bad about Europe. Um, okay, then the next one is the mutual recognition procedure. Now that is quite similar to the decentralized procedure, except that it, it, it functions when the company has already got a marketing authorization approved in, in Europe somewhere, and they want to get some more in other countries. And then you submit um, what's called a repeat wave application. So you submit a number of marketing authorization applications and you get, again, based on mutual recognition, uh, national licenses granted in those new countries you've chosen. And then the last one is a national procedure, but this is only suitable now if you want to submit in just one country and obtain one license. Uh, but it is still used sometimes by companies who, who maybe need to do things step by step, um, uh, but, but probably ones that are either uh, you know, a little bit smaller, maybe a bit more cash constrained, that kind of thing. Your big companies, your big multinationals, Will be looking to do centralized most of the time and DCP if not to get um, pan-European approval. Okay so if I jump, jump down to the next slide a few more facts on each of these procedures and some um, schematics as well. So the centralized procedure as I said it gives you an MA valid for the whole EU. 
It's compulsory for a number of different types of drugs, as on this, as shown on the slide here. Um, it's optional for others, but you have to put in an eligibility request and you have to be able to demonstrate some kind of um, uh, benefit to the patient population in Europe or some kind of technological advancement in the product to secure that eligibility um, to the centralised procedure. Uh, I said I said it was the review was coordinated by the EMA, which it indeed is, but they don't actually have assessors at the EMA, so they don't review it. They appoint a co a rapporteur and a co rapporteur um, to conduct the assessment, and and the rapporteurs are national agencies in Europe. So you know one one country is usually appointed as the lead uh, and one to support them. And then when they've done their assessment, the uh, recommendations from that assessment go through up forward to the CHMP and they give an opinion, uh, hopefully approval. Um, and then the e European Commission actually puts that opinion into law and grants the uh, marketing authorization. There's a couple of interesting things to note about the centralized procedure. You can get conditional approval, which is where you've maybe got limited clinical data, um, but the benefit of making the drug available immediately, so kind of you know life-threatening, not very well um, uh, treated conditions, that kind of thing, um, uh, it, it, where that, that availability outweighs the risk, then you can get a conditional approval, which is valid for one year, and will usually have some obligations attached, like generating further clinical data. Uh, you can also get an MA granted under exceptional circumstances, which is slightly different, but often confused with conditional approval. So it's where it's pretty difficult for a, a company to actually provide the data. Um, not, it's not a question of timing, which is with conditional approval. It's more like the condition is so rare or it's unethical, should we say, to perhaps have a control arm in a study that you can't quite generate the data that you would normally want to see. And then that's where you can get approval under exceptional circumstances. And I haven't put a link to this, but you can go onto the EMA website and you can look at products that have been approved and you can see whether they have a normal approval, if I can call it that, or conditional approval or um, were approved under exceptional circumstances. So a couple of last points to note. You get a single trade name across the EU and you get the same legal status in all countries. That makes sense because it is one European marketing authorization. You also get uniform labeling across the whole of, of, of Europe. So obviously there are linguistic differences, so it's not all in one language, but the translations and having accurate translations is a really important part of the centralized procedure. So you effectively do have harmonized labeling in the whole EU. Okay, this just very quickly gives you an idea of the timelines for the centralized procedure. Um, it, it's a very simple slide, this one, but the key takeaway from this is that it's 210 days of initial assessment. Uh, but what, that, what it doesn't show here really, other than the circles called clock stop, is when you get a question or some questions from the authority, they stop the clock. So that 200 days can soon rapidly expand. So if I jump down to the next slide, this is a little bit more detailed and shows you um, a number of different steps. So I'll quickly point out the most salient things here. At day 80, you get um, initial assessment reports from, from the rapporteur and co-rapporteur. Um, day zero is obviously when the, when the application has been deemed valid, sorry, I should say that, and the assessment clock starts. Day 80, you get your reports. At day 120, you get a list of questions. Uh, and then when you've received that, day one to one, that's when the, oh, sorry, day 120, that's when the clock stops and then restarts at day one to one when you submit your responses. Now, sometimes you can have very easy questions and it doesn't take very long to respond, but sometimes you might be faced with generating some more data of some sort. So, you know, that clock, clock stop can be quite long. Uh, and then you go through with a joint um, assessment report. And then at what they call a list of outstanding issues at day 180, uh, where you then work to resolve those. It's not on here, but you may have to go to a hearing to do that. Uh, and ultimately you get to a CHMP opinion at day 210 and then a, a decision afterwards. I've noticed there's one um, acronym here that I missed. It's down the bottom, but it's not on my last slide. The uh, EPAR is a, a public assessment report generated by the EMA trying to be as transparent as possible. 
So when they approve a product or even um, reject it, if it goes right through the application, they publish the EPAR on their website. And they're actually a really, in, if you're into regulatory affairs uh, and drug licensing, they're a really interesting document to read, especially if you're working on a, say a similar drug in a similar therapeutic area, because you can see where, um, you know, where things were perhaps a bit more difficult. And also to, to some extent, you can see the kind of data that the, um, the company generated to support their application, not in detail, but just describes the number of studies and patients and what they what, what they looked at, that kind of thing. So I could useful to throw that into the, the talk, I think. Um, then if we go on to the decentralized procedure, this is open to products that are not mandated to use a centralized procedure. You select your EU countries and you, sele you select, the applicant selects a country to be reference member state, and that is to conduct the assessment of the dossier. That reference member state shares its assessment report with all the other member states that we've I've called on here, concerned member states. And they decide whether they're willing to mutually accept, um, you know, the first authority, the lead authority, the RMS's view. Um, they can disagree and you can have some interesting times trying to get them to all agree. Um, but theoretically, they should only raise issues of serious public health. Um, and then at the end of that process, you get national authority licenses granted, but they are linked by the procedure. And actually, another important point to just make here is that once you've used the decentralized procedure to register your drug, if you want to update that license in the future, you have to do it in all the countries. So they are national licenses, but they have to be maintained identically. So if you want to vary your license, amend it in one country, you have to amend it in all. And except for a couple of very rare examples of like local issues. Um, you can have different trade names and you can have different legal statuses on the national licenses though. So it's a, it's a little different to the centralized procedure in that regard. Uh, this again, just lays out some timelines. Um, you can see that the two, if I take to the third, draw your attention to the third step, that it's still two 10 days to get the assessment completed. But in here, you've got a referral to a group called CMDH, that a coordinating group for the decentralized and mutual recognition procedure authority group. Um, that's where you might resolve issues between, um, you know, either the applicant and the agencies, or in some cases, different agencies. Um, and then the licenses are granted nationally at the end of the process. Um, then if I talk about move on to talk about the mutual recognition procedure. This is kind of similar to the decentralized, except you already have a license in one country. Um, and you can't now by law submit another national application in Europe. If you have one, you are supposed to use uh, uh, the country that already has one to act as reference member state for others that you want in other countries where you want to register your drug. Uh, to mutually recognize that first approval. Now, I'll just tell you something a little bit interesting here. That's, that's fine when you have, should we say, a kind of well-regarded, reputable, easy to work with agency, but there are a few um, agencies who either are not willing, they don't have the resources. They should be willing by law, but they're not, very, they're not really willing to be a reference member state and it's difficult to work with them. So if a company finds themselves in that situation, so I don't mean to pick out one particular country, but I don't, I'm not aware that Greece have ever been reference member state that much. So if you had one license in Greece, if you were a local Greek company, for example, and you just suddenly decide you want to get your drug approved in the UK, well, not now after Brexit, but let's say in France, theoretically, you should go to the Greek agency and ask them to be reference member state, but you know that in practice, that doesn't work. So what companies actually tend to do is get a completely separate third party to, life, to, to act as applicant in, say, France, in my example. And then when it's approved, transfer the license back to the company that held the license in Greece. It, it's a step that a number of companies use to get around that problem of having to follow the mutual recognition procedure when they've got at least one license in Europe for a drug. Um, yeah, you, you do get some hold up sometimes in the same way as DCP. That's the last point on this slide. So we just move on. There are some timelines here. So this, this sort of shows what happens if you authorize the drug in one country first, and then you go on to ask for that 
license to be mutually recognized in, in different countries. In the interest of time, I won't speak too much about this, but just leave that there. And then if you go on to this one, this is, this is then where you've got your license already and you just want to evoke that mutual recognition procedure. But you can see that theoretically, it shouldn't take as long as 210 days. So the idea of mutual recognition is because you've got one license already that you can shorten the time to approval in other countries. Okay, the last um, one to mention is that countries still do have national procedures um, and you can submit in a single country. Um, they're often focused on hitting the mandatory timelines involved in being part of a centralized or decentralized procedure. So it is true to say that national procedures can sometimes be a bit of a poor relation when it comes to timelines to get them approved. Some agencies have managed to apply similar timelines to the decentralized uh, and assess in two, 10 days. But in some countries where maybe they're a bit more resource constrained in the agency, you can end up running into you know, years to get approval. So it, it's not an often used route these days. Having said that, of course, the UK came out of the EU, so things have had to change a bit for us in the UK. So well, I apologise for my medicines spelling in the top of this slide. Um, so obviously we have the MHRA in the UK looking after regulatory matters. And um, there's a few points on here that, that are sort of different related to sort of national licences or yeah, obtaining a UK licence. So first of all, Existing, um, and that's centralised procedures, sorry, I should have just used CP there to keep it the same as the acronym I've used throughout. But for centralised um, products, they were converted by the MHRA into national GB licences at the start of this year. Um, and just a point about Northern Ireland, because of the Northern Ireland protocol there, existing centralised procedure licences remain valid. Uh, it's quite a complicated situation with Northern Ireland, and, and I, I don't think pharma, pharma, uh, pharma, pharmaceutical registration is the only area where it's complicated, but it's certainly not excluded from being a bit complicated. There's also something called a reliance route now available, a reliance procedure in the UK, which is where if there is a recent centralised or a DCP or mutual recognition li approval licence granted, you can apply to obtain a GB licence. Uh, to the MHRA and have a much shorter timeline to get it approved. So if, if effectively, it's a bit like the UK, the MHRA mutually recognizing one of those other approval routes already for a drug. Um, there's also um, something called the UAP or Unfettered Access Program. I don't know who the hell came up with that, but it doesn't exactly slip off the tongue. Um, and that's available for um, licenses approved in Northern Ireland. Uh, and again, the UK will um, recognize, um, or the MHRA will recognize those unless they have some major objections. And then the last sort of recent thing that the, the MHRA have done is they've introduced what they call a rolling review. So this is for um, novel medicines or new active substances where um, modules of the dossier um, and, it, and it, is, it is in electronic format that it's submitted. That's all the E means in front of the ECTD or in front of CTD. Um, that dossier is submitted um, in sort of sections, basically, incrementally, and you get a kind of pre-assessment by the agency. And, and this, is a, this is not completely unique to the UK. Some other countries do this already. Um, uh, but what it does is it allows you to have a much better level of interaction with the authority as you go through and generate some data. So the whole idea is not only do you have not have the big review at the end, but also you have this in interaction going through. So issues can be kind of resolved and worked on almost in, in, in heart, you know, together with the agency um, so that um, applications are and products are ultimately approved quickly and brought to market quicker. Um, final point on that slide is that biosimilar applications can go through that rolling review route as well. So a, a quick slide on license maintenance. Um, there are many things you can do to your license. This is not exhaustive. These are just the key ones. So um, post authorization measures are, are, are often applicable if you've been given something like a conditional approval. 
where you need to provide some additional data in follow-up. Uh, licenses are granted for five years unless they are under exceptional circumstances and it's one year, so you have to renew it. Um, and then there are a number of variations. So if you want to amend a license, there are three, four different types of variation. One, a 1A immediate notification, that IN means, or one, yeah, IN. 1B and type two. Basically, they, they become more complex as you go down that list. So the simplest type of variation, something quite administrative is a 1A. A 1A immediate notification means it's slightly more um, involved. So you have to seek approval to implement it. Um, that's why you have to notify it immediately. With the 1A without the IN, you can collate these changes, implement them immediately yourself and submit them to the authority on an annual basis for them to have a record of the changes you've made. So in other words, it's kind of like pre-notification, pre if you like, for the 1AIN and implement, it's like a do and tell for the, um, the 1A. One Hi, B Kim. is it? Hi, Kim. Just two yeah. minutes left, please. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, I should just about be all right. Um, one B is a bit more complicated, um, generally taking like 30 days to approve. And type two standard, there are some variants around this, but standard type two uh, variation application is uh, 90 days to approval. And then there are changes to leaflet and labeling, so called Article 61, three notifications, which are also 90 days to approval. So yeah, I think I'm almost there, Lee, actually, you'll be pleased to know. So these are, there's a number of links here that I hope would be useful to you. They, I only put them together um, this week, so they should all be good, alive, and working well. Um, and then, despite the fact that I spotted a couple more in that presentation, most of my acronyms are in this slide just to, uh, to help anyone trying to understand the talk afterwards. So really, the last point to close on is just to say, are there any questions? I'm happy to try and answer any that anyone has. That's, that's great. Th thank you very much, um, Kim, for a, a fascinating talk. And, and in particular, that I think that uh, acronym slide at the end there is going to be really useful um, because uh, clearly there, there's, there's a lot uh, going on in the, the, the slides. But th thanks very much. Re really, really useful. Um, and hopefully everyone got quite a lot out of that. I, th I think what we'll do um, in the interests of time um, is ask if anyone has any questions, if they type them into the chat or email them to Lee and then Lee can follow up with Kim to get those answers um, in, in due course. Um, Lee, will we also open up an area on the community site as well for further discussion um, in the aftermath? That's right. But of course, Kim's not on that. So oh, again, we'll have to manage questions through that platform and then um, I'll send them and post them back. So yeah, yeah we can do yeah. it lots of different ways. Sorry to run over a bit. I'm, I'm happy to answer the questions that come through You know that route. And to be honest, if anyone wants to have a chat with me, I'm happy to like, hook up with them on a Teams meeting or Zoom call as well. That, that's superb. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, for that, Kim. And, and I'm sure you'll get a lot of uh, a lot of interested parties getting in touch. Um, so th th thanks for that, um, Kim. And uh, OK, well, we'll, I hope we'll, it was useful. And any any feedback on whether it hit the mark or it didn't would be gratefully received. Great stuff. Th th thanks, Kim. All right. OK, and I can actually I can see that the, the questions are coming in already. So, yeah, you have a busy time catching up on all of those. Fantastic. OK, so do you want me to stay or do you, do I leave you guys? Um, it's entirely up to you. If you want to if you want to be part of the, the, the breakout rooms, then you're more than welcome to stay and, and, and add your your input. Um, or if uh, you want to get 19 minutes back, then it's entirely up to you. Well, I have a meeting at three. Steve, so I, I, I'm okay if um, if you think it would be useful, I'm more than happy to stick around for 20 minutes. It's up, yeah, it's up that, to you. That would be fantastic if if that's if that's good with you, Kim. That would be fantastic to have you involved. Thanks a lot. Okay, so we have uh, about 20 minutes left, um, and the the plan, as always in these sessions, um, is to use that. Um, for a fairly intense and concentrated uh, return to the curriculum review. Um, so in the first half of the year, up until the beginning of summer, we managed to um, go through all the core knowledge statements associated with the undergraduate curriculum and develop broad learning outcomes and uh, some supportive resources. Um, we're still playing around a bit with that in the background. There'll be information on that in due course.